Good afternoon. I'm John Bitson, the Menard Family Director of the Sheila and Robert Challey Institute for Global Innovation and Growth. Welcome to the Menard Family Distinguished Speaker Series. I'm really excited today that we're joined by Tammy Reller. Tammy's a local success story, somebody who grew up in Grand Forks, North Dakota, became CFO of Microsoft Windows, became Executive Vice President of Microsoft, and a CEO of a major healthcare company. And so I know we're going to learn a lot uh, from Tammy today. We're going to talk about the healthcare industry, the technology industry. We're going to talk about leadership uh, skills, talk about her strategic thinking. Uh, she was also involved in the Burgum campaign, so we're going to talk about her experience there. So I'm really excited about what we're going to learn today. Uh, Tammy, uh, so before we start, I want to mention that you'll get a chance to ask your own questions of Tammy at the end, so please get your questions ready. Looking at you, Caden and Karsten, I want a question from both of you guys today. Uh, so we'll have a mic <laughs> runner later on. Um, so Tammy Reller is an experienced business professional who began her career at Great Plains Software in Fargo. She went on to become Executive Vice President of Marketing at Microsoft, CFO at Microsoft Windows, and CEO of Dooley Health and Care. Most recently, she served as Chair of the Best of America Political Action Committee, supporting Burgum, the Burgum presidential campaign. Reller earned her bachelor's degree in mathematics from Minnesota State University, Moorhead, and a master's degree in business administration from St. Mary's College in Moraga, California. Um, and so I'd like to express my gratitude to the Menard family, to all of our donors, and to everybody for being here today, and my appreciation to Tammy for being here. So let's all give a warm welcome to Tammy Reller. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Well, I feel very, very honored uh, to, to be here. I mean, truth be told, John, um, so I had a chance to meet Bob and Sheila and this summer, and they introduced me to John, and then John asked if I might be willing to do this, and we picked a date, and I said yes, and we picked a date, and then I went and looked at all the speakers that he's had a chance to have before, so I wish I had looked at that before I said <laughs> yes. I was very humbled, very, very humbled to be amongst that group, so I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and I just very much hope that I can add some value through this dialogue, and I know your questions. And John's great questions uh, will help bring out a good discussion um, here today. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited about it. Um, and so I know you made a long trip today in not the best of weather. You probably would have preferred to come on, you know, when it was 58 a few All days good. ago. But, but anyway, so, All good. Uh, but, but thanks for coming. So I think I'd like to start out, um, again, just on the, with the success story. So again, you grew up in Grand Forks, had a very successful career in both you know, technology and still have a successful career in healthcare. It's very inspirational to a lot of people. And I wonder if you could just maybe talk a little bit about your story, um, your background, growing up in North Dakota and, and what it meant to your, your life and to your career. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's always this interesting thing when, you know, I, I, I'm highly uncomfortable when I hear you talk about, you know, even my past, because I always think about the things that I haven't yet achieved or things that I wish I would have done differently. Um, so thank you for all of those kind words and leaving out all the, <laughs> only sharing the good stuff. So thank you uh, for, <laughs> for that. Um, but I, you know, I think like many uh, people uh, came from very, very humble uh, beginnings. I grew up on a farm, started on a farm. Um, as my mom tells the story, when I was born, came home to a trailer home with no running water yet. So, I mean, very humble beginnings on a farm and then moved to Grand Forks in um, fourth grade, um, which was a very scary experience going from a farm to Grand Forks. I just went to my best friend's 60th um, birthday party, which exposes my age, which is great. Um, and I was just reminded on, you know, how I practiced walking to school. It was only like four blocks away, but I was so nervous, fourth grade, coming to this big town. So, you know, every step was a big, you know, a big one. And so then um, I went away to college uh, to uh, Moorhead. Uh, and, you know, that proved to be really quite an amazing uh, experience. And, you know, I think as I think about, you know, what influenced me, I had a lot of strong, or several, I should say, strong women in my life, including my mom, who really had to bring home uh, the bacon for the family, and, um, and my grandma, and, and others. And I, you know, had some strong mentors. And frankly, I just had some really lucky breaks that I didn't, you know, screw up. And I think that 
you know, can happen to anyone, and it certainly happened to me. And I, I never, like, I just never let myself lose sight of that, which is, you know, lucky breaks are at least a third of my success and maybe more. And so, you know, look for those, take advantage of those, don't feel guilty about those. Um, you know, they really can be, you know, they really can be part of it. So um, I had a great math teacher in high school who was a wonderful influence on me. And I loved math, and so that's what I decided to major in because it was I couldn't think of anything else that made sense to me. Um, and then, you know, my mom, I was a first generation uh, college student, and my mom saved up enough for one year, but then I needed to pay my way through the rest of school. And so then I, you know, was at the student union in at Moorhead State. And, you know, back then that's where you studied, that's where you got your information, and you know, sort of one index card, you know, changed my life, recipe card, index card. And it was for a receptionist position at Great Plains Software at a time where, when the word software wasn't a common word. I mean, I had to think about it, you know, try to understand, okay, what are we talking about? So anyway, long story short, you know, I, I became a receptionist at Great Plains Software and then, you know, ultimately, you know, didn't, didn't leave. Yeah, that's awesome. And so, so when you started at Great Plains Software as a secretary, did you think, well, this is a great college job? Or did you start thinking, like, maybe I'm going to have a career? Or when did you start thinking, I guess, maybe I'm going to have a career in this? You know, I didn't think, I, I mean, I didn't probably even think about the word. I know I didn't think about the word career because I, you know, what I did know is I loved the people and I loved sort of the business of it. So I went from being, you know, the receptionist to really being a project manager, you know, helping now. Governor Burgum, you know, with a number of different projects, so got to know him, you know, maybe a little bit better than I would normally in that type of a, a position. I was employee number 35, so everybody knew everybody, let's be clear. So, um, but then I, um, but then I needed more hours to be able to make more money, and so then I became an intern, which back then really just meant you got paid less than other employees um, in the accounting department. So I was at, in the accounting department of an accounting software company, you know, sort of learning the business. And I just loved the business of it, of it all. Um, but then I, you know, I was going to go and get my master's and become an actuary is what I was going to do. And I was all set to do that. I put in my notice and then, and then, um, and then uh, Doug said, you know, hey, we're opening up a sales force. We don't have any salespeople. Go anywhere in the U.S. you want and stay with, stay with the company. Um, and so that's, what I, so that's what I did. And, and my fiance and I moved, um, now husband moved to the Bay Area. And, you know, not even really realizing that it was the Silicon Valley. It's just the only place I'd ever flown in my life before then. I had an aunt and uncle that I could stay with. And so, you know, that's where I that's where I moved. So no, I really didn't think about you know it as a career. I just I think what I did do, whether purposeful or not, is to take advantage of that lucky break, and just got as much out of that job as I as I could. Yeah, I think that's important. I mean, I think we all have those breaks, and you have to see yeah. them well, first of all, recognize right. them, and then also take advantage of them. Right. So, yeah. So I I had read a story about. Um, Doug crashing your going away party. So is that when is that when he talked you into taking this new position? Yeah, like, it was actually at your going away party. It was. Great it was because he hadn't. You know, I mean, I, I didn't. I worked. You know, for someone for someone who worked for him. So he wouldn't have known that I was uh, leaving. Um, but he there was a gathering and he joined the gathering and you know that's when he said you know instead of doing you can always go back and get advanced degree. You can always do that. You know, why don't you um, try doing this? Because I had, um, I had also, you know, done some um, sort of semi sales. Just even, you know, given that I knew the software so well, they would pull me in to talk to customers because I use the software every day. So they'd pull me in. Um, so I had interaction with customers, and so I'd shown some signs that I, you know, could be a normal person with customers. <laughs> and so he's like, "Why don't you, you know, go out and and do this?" Um, so yeah, that's a, that is a great story. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So I'm interested. So you had a very, you know, very successful career in technology, going 20 years, you know, in technology, and then you shifted to healthcare. So I'm, that's a very interesting career move to me. And so I'm just wondering, can you talk a little bit about? What went into your decision to move from yeah. technology career to a healthcare career? 
Yeah, I mean, there was really two factors. When we lived in Seattle, which we did um, for almost a decade after the Microsoft acquisition of Great Plains, um, I had been on the board of Seattle Children's Hospital, just as a, you know, a, a means to give back. Um, and, you know, ended up getting, I was, um, I think I was, uh, I got involved, I reported out the financials for the foundation, et cetera. So I got into the sort of the guts of the financial part of it as well as, you know, really being able to see the more, imp the impact on the community. And so I did get interested in healthcare um, in in Seattle just a little a little bit, and then wanted to move back to the Midwest for family reasons, and then got an offer from you know United Health Group, which really you know is one of the preeminent employers in certainly in the Midwest, but I would also say nationally and, and yeah. internationally. And so it just all came together, you know, and you turn 50 and I'm like, okay, I think I want another big thing, you know, at least one other big thing, uh, another experience. Um, I mean, it's fascinating. When I had been interviewing at United Health Group, which even was a really short process because, you know, I knew some people there, et cetera, uh, it was the first time I'd interviewed for a job since I was, 19 years old trying to get a receptionist job like I you know it just hadn't gravity had kind of taken taken hold of my career so it was actually kind of exciting to go through that decision process um, and so yeah that's how I ended up at United Health Group and I really fell in love with healthcare and loved that organization yeah awesome so are there are things that you've learned are there things you've learned in technology in your career being in a technology career that maybe you applied to your work in the healthcare sector? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I do think that, you know, if you look at technology and you look at healthcare, you know, especially speaking to, you know, a number of students is, you know, both are really amazing, you know, I, I guess industries is a correct way to say it. I mean, they're so far reaching that, you know, they go beyond uh, a narrow industry definition, but there, there's almost, there's so, so many possibilities, and in the case of healthcare, you know, so much that's still broken, uh, that has such opportunity to get better, um, that I think there's just endless opportunities. I mean, you can't go wrong in either one of those industries, and frankly, there's so much interlap, inter, um, uh, interconnections between healthcare and technology. So I feel like whether it's you know business models, whether it's scaling, whether it's ecosystems, like there's so many ways that I was able to apply. And yet I came into healthcare very naive about you know what it was and how you could impact it. So you know I also had to be very respectful of the fact that I was entering something that I knew very little about. So, so from what you're saying, you would recommend like a young person that wants to consider Absolutely. pursuing a career in either one of them? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Endless opportunities. Okay. Awesome. Um, and so I have a question. So both the healthcare industry and technology industries, yeah. and I, a lot of industries require an innovative mindset, entrepreneurial type mindset. And so how do you foster uh, an innovative entrepreneurial mindset in the teams that you work with? Yeah, and I'll maybe speak to both, you know, what I've done and maybe just what I've seen done in other companies and, and right. teams uh, more, uh, more generically. But I, from what I have experienced, I think there's two big elements to it. There's a big cultural element to innovation, and then there's more of a, you know, system and process side of, side of it. And I think both are equally important uh, to, the, to the equation. On the culture side, you know, you have to have an organization um, that's willing to fail. I mean, if you're not willing to fail and if there are, you know, if it's a very punitive culture, which there's plenty of them out there, it's not going to foster innovation because, you know, people will not be afraid to innovate and therefore potentially make mistakes. Uh, because they you know there will be negative repercussions. So I think that's a big part of you know the culture. And that's maybe more the negative way to describe it. You know, on the positive side, you know, it needs to be a culture that, you know, asks for ideas, welcomes ideas, allows conversations to happen where ideas, you know, can flow and be added upon and augmented and changed and and um, discussions can freely, freely happen. So I think there's just those super important cultural elements, which does start with leadership. 
yep. um, which I know you and I will talk about that as we as we go. So I think that's a big part of it. And okay. then this, on the system side of it, you know, it differs, and there's not one you know, there's not one right answer, but, you know, is there a budgeting pro approach where there actually is dollars that, you know, can be, um, can be set aside or can be, um, you know, bargained for uh, to invest in uh, innovation? That's a big part of it. You know, some, sometimes zero-based budgeting works for that. Sometimes there's other mechanisms that work, you know, equally well, but is that a part of, you know, the organization? Um, you know, second, you might have teams or roles that are dedicated or some organizations that doesn't work well and that backfires because then it doesn't happen, you know, in the team. So I think just making a decision about how structurally um, you're going to set up to, you know, have innovation, you know, have innovation happen. So I think those are, I think if you come at it from both those angles, you know, you can ensure that innovation you know, happens. And then there's a lot of tactics that, you know, can spur innovation challenges and, you know, codathons, et cetera. So do you signal to like potential employees, do you, is there a way that you signal to them that this is going to be a culture that, you know, doesn't, is not punitive and, you know, encourages innovation and that we have these various processes in place to, to try to foster innovation? Do you try to do that? And I'm wondering, on the other side, this is a long question, but also like how do you try to identify whether the people that you're hiring are maybe have an innovative mindset? Or is yeah, um, uh, there's no, no easy answer to those questions. I mean, I think on the first one, I think you have to state what, you're, what you stand for as a leader, as an organization, as a leadership team. And then you have to walk the walk. I mean, there's, you, you have to give that time and it has to sink in and you have to be true to that and you, know, you have to just live it every day. Um, and I think that's where, and that's, you know, that can definitely backfire if you've got sort of these set of principles, but then you know, actions uh, and what you reward, in particular what you reward and who you reward is different from those principles that can really you know backfire so i think that you know the tightness of that loop needs to be you know really really strong um, in terms of what to look for um, for innovators, you know, I think it comes in a lot of different forms. I mean, there's super creative people, but then there's more methodical people, and all of that, you know, can can work. So, I mean, I believe a that many different skills and personalities are capable of innovation. I don't think they're sort of hey, that person's innovative, that person's not, because I think that the environment can draw out innovation from really smart people with great experiences. So that's where I think leaders and and the systems that they create around them can make a very, you know, a very big difference. I do think generally looking for we people versus I people will help you with innovation mm -hmm. because they're willing to work, you know, as a team and work with within the within the system. So I think that's one one thing you can look for, there's multiple little things you can look for in interviews, but you know, I believe in this concept of you know, blink where you can really you know, read, read people quickly. And I think that's one thing, which is, you know, are they we people or are they I people? Yeah, awesome. And so, I mean, I think you kind of answered that. You just said all kinds of people can be innovators, but are there any kinds of activities, training, or things like that that people can use to kind of sharpen their innovative uh, skills or their entrepreneurial mindset that you know of? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot out there and I don't know that I'm even the expert in it. I definitely, you know, believe that just trying different things, whether it's, you know, whether it's offsites, whether it's, you know, using some of the tools to allow people to, you know, to brainstorm, et cetera. You know, what I have found backfire a little bit is where you sort of put all your eggs in one, you know, consultant basket. Like we're going to do, like we're going to use this consultant, they're going to come in for this day, and that's our, that's how we're going to make innovation happen. I think it has to be much more natural and consistent in your environment to get true innovation over time. So like what works within, you know, do you just, do you have you know, you have weekly staff meetings that are more operational and then you have, you know, time that's set aside more for strategy and innovation. I mean, I think you just have, be dedicated to it, be consistent with it and, you know, set it up so that it becomes something that, you know, is, um, you know, is a way that the whole team can, you know, 
develop their own you know, creativity and innovative mindset. Awesome, and so you just talked about strategy and innovation. So I just wanna ask you about strategic decisions. Obviously, you know, being a high level executive, you have to make strategic decisions very frequently, mm -hmm. launching major product lines. Yep. You know, in your personally too, just in your career, you've made a lot of strategic decisions. And so can you talk about like what kind of framework do you use when you're making important decisions? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, like, I, I, there's no rocket science here for me. I think that, you know, when you are making decisions, I think there's maybe two things that are important that I think about. One is, are you super clear on what you're trying to accomplish? You know, is it one thing, is it multiple things? And if it's multiple things, what's the pecking order of those multiple things? I mean, just clarifying and stating that clearly. Because I think sometimes, you know, one of the things that I've learned from mentors is just never make assumptions. And, you know, sometimes you go in trying to make a decision and you assume that the goals are clear or you assume that everyone is aligned on what the goals are. It's usually not true. And so just taking the time to, you know, clarify what the goals are and what the priority of those goals are. Um, being realistic about the time frame, et cetera. I mean, I think that's just, you know, starting with that end in mind, so to speak, just to go back to some basics, is super important in any decision making. And then I think the other thing that's always a misnomer is that leaders make all the decisions. You know, good leaders actually don't. I mean, they do know that there are times where they do need to call the ball and they do need to snap the line and say, we're going this way. Mm -hmm. um, but their you know, great leaders you know, use their team and the expertise of their team to really get at you know, a framework to then you know, make the right decision and then execute on that decision. Um, but I think the other you know, leg of the stool is that once a decision is made and you've used you know, the appropriate framework, including clarifying the goals, is that communication back on that decision. You know, here is the decision, here's exactly what we mean by that decision, um, and here's you know, the rationale and next steps. Uh, because I think sometimes that part you know, either gets shortchanged or you know, not, not done either. So all of that important. Yeah, very important. And, and you obviously have highlighted some leadership principles in what you just talked about, but uh, if you could elaborate just a little bit more on what are some of the leadership principles maybe that you've used and that you think are really important for both your personal life and yeah. for your career as well? Yeah, and this is, this is always a hard one. I love this question, but it's always a hard one, and I feel like I change, change it up a little bit sometimes based on recent experience. But you know, there's, a, there's a long list of leadership qualities that you know, are so important to, uh, to be a great leader. But I'll highlight ones that I, you know, that just stay, con stay consistent for me as I think about people that I respect and, and where I've been successful or not successful and, and why is that so. One is, you know, self-awareness, self-awareness, self-awareness. I mean, if you are a self-aware person, certainly a self-aware leader, you know, you are your own best coach. You're the person that's sort of most vested in you. And, you know, if you can just always, um, you know, be... Uh, if you can just always be making yourself better through your own self-awareness, that's awesome. And frankly, just you know, good instincts. I was reading this story this morning, and it's probably older, and I'm just catching up now. But the Kellogg CEO um, was on Squawk Box talking about this new this new advertising campaign, which essentially says "Eat cereal for dinner," and just he just got destroyed. Um, and, and, you know, and I'm like, okay. Like, I just thought to myself, like, how did that happen? How did that happen? And the reality is it probably happened because, you know, there was some great market research that the team did that said, you know, hey, if we can get, because the whole idea was eat cereal for dinner. If you're, if you're in financially hard times and you can't afford dinner, have cereal. Um, that was the idea. So, and he got destroyed in social media, as he should have. And, um, and you sort of go, okay, how did that, like, how did that happen? How did that happen? Because it's not only his comments, but it's an advertising campaign, it's a big deal. I mean, this can be, this can, recovery time on this is gonna be interesting. Um, 
But, you know, there was probably some amazing market research that said this is a whole new market. This is a whole new market segment for us. This is going to create, you know, X billion and this, that, and the other. And, you know, and then it rolls out and someone, you know, told them to say this, et cetera. And, you know, and that's another thing for a leader. It's just so important that you don't get into the, you know, sort of emperor has no clothes zone where you just surround yourself with people that just tell you what you want to hear. Like you have to have, you know, you have to be self-aware and you have to have honesty coming at you at all times. And um, so clearly, you know, self-awareness and trusting his instincts, or maybe those were his instincts and that's a whole nother issue. I don't know, but um, you know, it's just so important. So that's my number one. That has stayed my number one for a long time. And then I would say um, authenticity. Like you just, you know, you, you like don't, you know, yes, you're in this leadership position, but you know, it probably happened. At least a third of it was a lucky break. So, like, don't get all full of yourself. You know, you're here. You're here to serve the people that are trusting in you. So, you know, don't just be be authentic and stay stay that way always. Um, and the other one I would say is uh, transparency. You know, if you, I mean, yes, sure, there are some things that you can't be fully transparent on, but be as transparent as the situation allows. Like, it pays dividends all day long. Uh, and then communication. Like, you have to be a strong communicator. And, you know, it doesn't mean you have to be perfectly eloquent or perfectly motivational at all times. You know, communi good communication comes in many you know, in many forms, including from introverts. But you have to be a communicator and dedicate, you know, dedicate time to that. So, I mean, there's more, but those to me are the ones that just always stay consistent. I think that's awesome because those really kind of all go together. They do. You communicate more, you're going to be more transparent. Yes. Um, if you are admitting mistakes, okay, you're more yes. transparent, which makes you more have more humility, but be more authentic. Um, anyway, I think, and then you surround yourself with no people then is what you're saying, right? You don't surround yourself with just yes people, yes. right? Okay, that's exactly. awesome. Yeah, I like the, all those exactly. are good. Yeah. Awesome, so, um, so I wanna just shift gears a little bit Please. and I just wanna ask you, so um, you've had a career, I mean, in healthcare now, but you had a 20 year career in software and, and I know that the software industries and STEM industries in particular um, yeah. tend to be very male dominated. And so could you just talk about some challenges that you encountered being in technology as a woman? Yeah, and I think, you know, the good news is things just keep changing and, you know, getting better. Um, what I found is that, you know, I didn't like the numbers, meaning just the percentages of, you know, women in those roles. Although at Great Plains we had, you know, Kathy could keep me honest on this, but we had, you know, I think 42%. Uh, women at Great Plains at the time of the acquisition by Microsoft and again so what's the lesson be intentional if you're intentional you know it can it can it can happen and like we all felt like one big team there wasn't you know women versus you know versus men um, and so then more macro when I look at Microsoft you know the numbers weren't you know any more impressive than the rest of technology they weren't worse but they weren't you know they weren't better uh, but the environment was not one where you couldn't succeed uh, as a as a you know as a woman. Were there moments, etc. Sure, but um, you know I always I I would tell people that I started talking louder when I went to Microsoft, and I actually did because I just felt like you just it just you know standing up in a meeting or talking louder. I mean I I, I just assumed it would be a little harder going from Great Plains to, you know, Microsoft as a woman. So I just, I did think about some techniques. Did I really, really need them? I don't know, but I did, you know, use them. And I think that's maybe the, you know, one lesson, which is know your environment, be cognizant of your environment, and are there some tools, authentic tools, I'm good with talking loud, that you can, you know, that you can use uh, to make yourself, you know, make yourself more, um, you know, more effective. Um, I remember I was mentoring this just incredible uh, woman who is rising in leadership, so a young leader. Um, and, you know, she was more slight um, and had a softer voice. And I, you know, and she just was so frustrated because she felt like she just couldn't get herself heard. And Microsoft is a culture where, I mean, it's, it's intense and people talk over each other and don't think twice about it. And, you know, it's just, it's an intense, and it, that creates some good things, it creates some challenges. 
And so, you know, I said, listen, just use some techniques. I said, like, just stand up more. Like, stand up in a meeting, grab a whiteboard pen, and people will think you're about to say something brilliant. And so, you, like, just use whatever techniques you can to get your point across. Like, just don't give up. Don't, don't say, ugh, it's a tough environment. I just can't make it happen. Like, figure it out. And I think that's, you know, that's one thing. And I think on the STEM side, you know, with, with women, the one other thing that I think is so important um, is that what I find is that, you know, women tend to look to women as mentors. I mean, I know that when I was, and I suspect Kathy would say the same thing, is when I was at Microsoft, I, I would get so many requests from my male colleagues who, you know, were aware that they were really trying to um, advance uh, female leaders within their organizations, and so they, you know, wanted to get them mentorship. And so then they would come to me and, and others, of course, and say, will you be, you know, will you be a mentor? And, you know, at first I just, like, you know, of course, I mean, I want to give and I want to help and I want to, you know, and so I just kept saying yes. And then, you know, I just had so many people on my roster. And then I just got to thinking, it's like, well, one, I can't do it all. And the other thing is, is if a, you know, female has a male leaders as a mentor, they're both going to learn. Like, they're just both going to learn. Like, well, how is it different to help this? And so then what I would say is, no. I will have, you know, I'll do sort of a coffee mentorship, a one-time mentorship with anyone, but, you know, find a male mentor because we need to have more of that because then it will be much more systematized um, because statistically speaking, you know, still was two-thirds or more uh, male leaders across the company. And so if they just felt more comfortable, you know, helping uh, females advance, it would make, you know, it would make a very big difference. Um, so. So has that been successful? I mean, yeah, it okay. was. Okay. I mean, okay. it was at the time. You know, it definitely. Right. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know how broad that is currently. So, so you talked about leaders. I'm just curious. So, um, the percentage you said of uh, people that were women at Great Plains was 42 percent, probably mm -hmm. in at unheard Microsoft. Unheard of. Unheard of in is technology. Like 25 percent. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and so that was an intentional thing by Doug Burgum yes. to try to. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and one other thing is, so when the your mentee started uh, going to the whiteboard and stuff, did that work? Did that? Did that she help said her? it did. Okay. I d I wasn't in meetings with her, so I don't know, but she said it did. Okay. Gave her some confidence. Awesome. And more than anything, it's not like that specific technique, but I think it was you know feel empowered to figure out what techniques will work. Like, what are right. your techniques? Right. You know, don't give up. Don't right. give up. Just keep. Keep at it. Okay, I tried that. You know, think about it. Did that work? Did that not work? You know, right. or just getting more comfortable with interrupting. Practice interrupting at home. Like I don't know, but like, what are your <laughs> techniques? <laughs> awesome. So yeah. I mean, so I I know there's various programs like Tech Girls and other things that are trying to um, attract more young women to STEM careers. And so yeah. I mean, and I think one thing I mean, you just mentioned maybe having. Um, male mentors be more intentional, encouraging young women. I, are there yes. other things like how can we get more young women interested in STEM careers in general? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a multi, multifaceted um, question for sure. And you know, from the research I've been able to see, I'm not an expert by any means, but it feels like there's you know in the in the middle school and high school, there's a lot of influence. And so I think there is sort of a macro um, need to just ensure that in you know, pre-college that there actually are programs which invite girls to yeah. come into you know, STEM careers and make it very, very clear including just introducing role models and you know whatever it may be mm -hmm. uh, because it does feel like there's it's kind of binary there which is you know decide to do something in that field or not um, so I think that's you know I think that's one thing that's really really important which is okay what's happening and maybe it is and then I think micro movements which is you know just everyone you know make making an effort to you know to do that 
yeah, encourage your daughter to, to yeah. consider STEM at least. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it can't just fall on you know females. It needs to be yeah, yeah, hundred exactly. percent yeah. everybody. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, are you if you are in STEM in college, are you you know have you volunteered to go back to your middle school? Have you volunteered to go back to your high school on career day? Have you? You know, I mean, we all should. We all should. Like, what yeah. what are the micro? What are the macro? Yeah, I mean, I think about particularly going back to like elementary school technology yeah. stuff. Yeah. I mean, and, I mean that's super yeah. interesting to yeah. to young kids. I mean, so that yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, I was listening on the way here. Um, I was listening to a Bemidji radio station just by chance, and there was a young female firefighter who was on the radio, just talking about you know just talking about her career and what she does, etc. And very accomplished. I mean, she'd gone to Bemidji State as a hockey player, you know, then went to Europe and played, and then came back and got her. So she has a math degree, undergrad, then she has um, fire sciences, masters, and then a masters in public safety or something. So she has all these, you know. But she just talked about. Um, uh, you know, talked about how she, this this career just really, you know, suited her and it was definitely more of a, you know, man's world, but, you know, the other firefighters embraced having her there and, you know, I mean, so just, but I think the thing that most mo motivated me about it and inspired me was the fact that she was willing, you know, she wasn't the greatest public speaker, but who cares? Like, she was willing to, like, put herself out there you know, go on the radio and talk about it. Now, do I think she will have an influence on, you know, young girls? Absolutely, absolutely. Like that, you know, so so that's, you know, somewhere between micro and macro, right? <laughs> Which yeah, is she, yeah. you know, she took a micro movement, but, you know, had had more of a, had more of an impact. So I find such inspiration through people like that. Yeah, that's so awesome. it was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Um, so I just wanted to, I'd like to ask you about your, uh, you were involved in the, as I already talked about, as chair of Best of America, the Political Action Committee, yeah. supporting Governor Burgum. So how did you get involved in that? Um, so I, um, well, I was honored to do it. Let me just first say that. And completely thrilled that he, you know, decided to do that. Um, and I, you know, I obviously got to know um, Governor Burgum early in my career and really just, you know, stayed a, uh, stayed close with him and Catherine, you know, throughout throughout the years, uh, and just career-wise, time-wise, I just could not really be involved in, you know, sort of his work as governor, which I would have loved to do, but just for a variety of reasons didn't work. But I always said to myself, and probably only verbalized it to my husband, that, you know, if he ever, you know, decided to go for a higher office, I would literally drop whatever I was doing and help him. And so that's what I did. That's what I did. What was the experience like for you? Uh, Eye-opening. Eye-opening. I mean, I've never been in politics before, and so it was, it was, um, it was humbling and eye-opening and gratifying, and I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Would do it again in a heartbeat for sure. And I think you know the lesson learned for me is well, one, you know, having a national presence super helpful, and obviously, you know, that was probably. Uh, something we lacked to start out, um, but also like I just do think Americans would, including me, would benefit from just being more involved in, you know, sort of who we, you know, who we choose to have, you know, represent us. And you know, we clearly need more business leaders in politics and government. We knew, we absolutely do. Yeah. yeah so, um, so interesting. You said you know eye-opening. So like, what what was there something that just like shocked you or surprised you about the process? Nothing shocked. Um, but I, I, I do think the last point I made, which is just the number of Americans that are sort of deeply involved in the process is, you know, pretty small. light. Yeah. It's right. pretty small, which is both, no, it's not, you know, it, it's, I would call that bad. Like, I, right. <laughs> we need yeah. to be more involved. Um, so yeah, that I think was, you know, that was one of the biggest epiphanies. Yeah, so I think that dovetails into something else I'd like to ask you about. And so we, we recently had Ben Klutze from Mercatus Center mm -hmm. here. Um, he has a program on pluralism, 
and it's focused on trying to reduce polarization. And so, That'd be great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, so I've been wondering when you traveled around. I mean, I I know you're saying that it's a small group of people involved in politics, but did you get the feeling that people are polarized just more so in your travels than just what you experienced with? watching news or things like that? Yeah, I mean, one of the, so tactically, one of the interesting things, and maybe I didn't fully appreciate this before, but so the PAC, the Political um, Action Committee, which I was the chair of, we can't have direct uh, communication with the candidate. So we can, you know, run into that candidate if we're at the same settings, but the idea is it's independent. So I didn't do traveling per se with um, the governor, uh, but I was, you know, interacting with um, potential donors, et cetera. So I'll maybe talk more, you know, more generically. I mean, I think the, um, I mean, it, just the overall, you know, I'd say rhetoric in politics has just become the norm here in, right. you know, in, in the U.S. and. You know, it maybe falls in the category of, you know, it is what it is. But, you know, I think we as humans and we as Americans, you know, seem to, um, you know, we like to blame the media. But honestly, like the media wouldn't do what they do unless we consumed it. And so, you know, I think we need to be less attracted to the noise and the drama and more grounded in, you know, what we actually need. Uh, in terms of you know policies and where we want to invest um, as a country and be more involved that way, um, so I'd love to see us mo be more involved prim pragmatically and you know less involved in the drama circle, and I think it would you know over time help quiet things down a little bit, but yeah. and, and help with the polarization, frankly. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that, is it accurate that people like align themselves with? blue or red, and then, then they don't even maybe sometimes think about individual issues because they're like, well, blue is supposed to be this, so I'm that, For sure. or red is supposed to be this. For and, sure, yeah, and that's so. where I, you know, yeah. I just think, I think it just would be, you know, seek to understand, you know, right. and I think that's, and, and that's where, you know, Governor Burgum is just, he's, you know, he, he, he could have been, I think, a real unifier. And right. it's interesting, one thing that's maybe less obvious is when he, thought about getting into the race, and then at the time he got into the race, he was very consistent with his three pillars of his platform and was consistent you know, through, throughout. Um, and, but at the time he got in, there was so, so many of the candidates and so much of the dialogue was you know, all about you know, the more social issues, um, which is you know, where so much of the drama ends up you know, residing. Because actually, so many of the other you know core elements, you can get more agreement on you know some of the policies at least, or at least agree it's an issue that a policy needs to be you know addressed um, for. And what we saw was that the other candidates ended up drifting to those you know those core pillars because they make sense. I mean, it's the economy, of which energy is a key part of it, and you know national security couldn't be more of a couldn't be more of an important topic. And so, you know, I he had influence much beyond what the numbers imply. I know he did. Right, right. But again, it's probably getting at that small number. You have the small yeah. active number that, that yeah. were kind of involved. Right, um, right. Yeah, so, so another thing related to traveling, I guess, you, you know, you've traveled a lot in your career, obviously, and you, and you lived in different cities throughout your career. So you've seen the way things are done in different places, and so, uh, one of the things I I think we have a pretty strong, innovative ecosystem, you know, around here. Especially we have Grand Farm, we have uh, Emerging Prairie, who's doing a lot in the entrepreneurial space. We have the Grand Sky Project up in Grand Forks. Um, but what are, do you see any opportunities or challenges that the Midwest has for creating an even stronger? innovative ecosystem? I mean, I think we have all the ingredients. We just need to be confident and just continuing to go after it. I mean, I think it's amazing. I mean, yes, we're an untold story. I mean, I think it's not even known. I mean, I think even, you know, people in the Twin Cities have no idea, really, largely speaking, you know, what, what can happen in, you know, some of the quieter parts of, of the Midwest. So the ingredients are absolutely here. Um, and we just need to we just need to be bolder about telling the story. 
Okay, so we need to toot our own horn again. Yeah, okay. yeah. awesome. Yeah. Okay, that yeah. sounds good. Um, so one of the things I I like to ask all of our speakers, I mean, so the Menard Family Distinguished Speaker Series is a way to bring in thought leaders like yep. you, you know, talking about increase, you know, improving the human condition, increasing economic opportunity, increasing human flourishing. It's also a chance for our students to hear from successful people like you, and maybe understand what they can do to become more successful themselves. And so. Do you have any pieces of advice that you would like to give to, to our students? Um, yes, I mean, the, 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 I'd be happy to. And you know, the biggest part of it is ask lots of people. You know, I'm just one person and, and ask lots of people this question because uh, you'll get lots of different, you know, lots of different in, input to filter through because that's going to be your biggest thing is just filter through because you'll get some bad advice too, including from me. Um, but I, you know, one of the things as I, I try to do is to look back and say, you know, what are some of those regrets? And, you know, some people don't, some people say don't look back and, you know, say you regret, et cetera, because you can't change, but you can learn and you can help others learn from it. I think it's one of the ways to give, to give back. Um, so the one, my starting piece of advice um, would be, be cognizant of, you know, going with sort of what I call gravity, meaning it's just feels like it's, you know, destiny for you. Um, you know, maybe your parents did X career, so you're gonna do X career. And that might be a great thing, by the way, because um, that happens lots of times and all parties are happy and successful. Um, or, you know, it's just the easier path versus, you know, the right path for you. But I think being super purposeful versus letting sort of gravity take shape because I, I without a doubt, my biggest regrets in my career or when I did not follow that advice, or just for whatever reason couldn't see through the, you know, see through the, um, see through to, to do that. So that's my biggest one, which is just be super purposeful, and even if it's the harder path but the right path, you know, sort it through, um, because, um, you know, a good decision is better than, you know, a, one you can execute on quickly. Um, so that would be one. The second one is you know, network, be really, really purposeful in your networking. It takes a ton of work and you have to do it wisely. You can't just, you know, network to network's sake. You actually have to be very purposeful about that. You know, who, and, you know, be giving as you, ne as you network. Very tactically meaning, you know, if you're gonna you know, have a coffee session with someone who you're networking with, you know, never leave that session without saying, how, how can I help you? What can I do for you? Um, this isn't just about, you know, what can they do for you, but, you know, what can you do for, um, for them? The world is small. Do not burn bridges. The world is very small. <laughs> you will, you will, you burn a bridge, you will regret that down, you know, down the road. Every interaction, you know, absolutely um, every interaction counts. Um, and then maybe just last, you know, be open to possibilities, even though, even if you're just a really organized person that's very planful and you have your path and you're not deviating off your path, you know, just be open to possibilities because you just never, you just never know. One of them might be a lucky break that you can, you know, take advantage of and want to take advantage of. Um, so those would be a couple. Yeah, those are awesome. And so another, I mean, I'm not going to put words into your mouth, but I'm thinking based on what you already said, also, maybe being aware of breaks that come to you, and then yes. also taking advantage of those breaks as yes. well, right? So, yeah, yes. Yeah. Also, I, th I think uh, every people in here, the students are demonstrating it that they showed up at this. So, Absolutely. I mean, again, so you thank think about you, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and we have you know excellent speakers like you coming here, and there's a lot to learn. So, kudos to the students that are taking advantage of, That's great. of coming to this and and others as well. Oh, so. and one other one, and Tate and I, I don't know where Tate's in the room, but um, he and I talked about this earlier, which is be low maintenance, not high maintenance. Like just you know, like high maintenance just doesn't serve you or anyone else well. So and employers can pick that out. Yeah, awesome. So I, I will, I'd like to, normally I'd like to leave a, you know, a good amount of time for uh, questions from the audience. And so I'd like to invite anybody who has questions right now to, um, we have a mic runner awesome. in the back. So if you just raise your hand and Caden and Karsten or others that want to ask questions, uh, now would be a good time. Ask me anything. 
Thanks, Tammy, for uh, sharing with us. Absolutely. The, one of the questions that comes to mind, you, you talked about a third of it being lucky. Uh, the other two thirds seems to me is hard work that you're putting behind that and preparing yourself to take advantage of that luckiness. Um, just curious, as you look into your future, is there a book in the future to share those things with, with people? Oh, what a great question. Is there a book? You know, I love reading and I do love writing. I actually, I, you, you mentioned my uh, MBA and I, you know, I'm so grateful that I took the time to do an MBA. It really changed in particular. I had a communications class, which was a game changer for me, just giving me the tools and the confidence to write. And I, um, and you also connected the dots between communication and transparency and authenticity and you know so I think just being able to you know to write one of the things that I did my first job at United Health Group um, I was initially going to go to United Health Group as a executive in residence which sounded really lovely because Microsoft was like it was a very I mean it was a it was a hamster wheel like it was a lot of hours and a lot of a lot of intensity and I loved it all but it was exhausting and so um, but then they needed someone to be the very first chief marketing officer they'd ever had at a sort of the new now bigger division of um, United Health Group called Optum and so it was first time role and you know really had been a deprived function of marketing etc and you know the team just kind of felt beat up etc and so one of the things that I did suggested by a great communicator uh, that was working in my organization, you know, she said, just write, write a blog um, and just help people get to know you and, you know, just, and, you know, just talk about whatever you want. I'm like, really? She's like, do it every Friday. I'm like, oh my God, I can't commit to every Friday. So we called it uh, Many Fridays. That was the name of the blog. Um, and I actually, you know, it's a highlight of my career, just being able to write that. And, and it was just musings. It was, you know, I mean, I wrote about Taylor Swift before Taylor Swift was who she is today, you know, because I just learned so many things from her, you know, as a then 25-year-old, 20, you know, really controlling her own, you know, her own destiny and handling these really tough situations. I mean, you can just learn from so many people. And so I tried to take just, you know, lessons from other industries and put that into it. So um, I just, it, it helped me understand just how much I loved to write and love to find inspiration and learnings, you know, from elsewhere. And, and it, and it did help people get to know each other and me and the team and, and was very, very effective. So um, long story short, I have no idea if I have the ability or or drive to write a book, um, but I will say one of my dear dear friends from Microsoft uh, just released a book um, called Worthy. It actually has "un" in front of it, and she crosses it out, so it's actually Worthy. Her name is Jane Bulware, and I mean I know her well. I know her story well. I know. Uh, most of her career at Microsoft well and I still you know was shocked how much I learned um, and like it was so humbling to see someone put themselves out there uh, in a book I mean it's very raw and very honest um, and so that actually made me think about the question you know but most of me says I don't think I have anything that interesting to say but you know maybe I could come up with stuff but um, anyway um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm super respectful of people who have, you know, who have done that. And I actually, you know, one of the questions John um, was thinking about asking is just, you know, who do you find inspiration from? And I just really try to find it everywhere. I love reading autobiographies. Like, I just think there's so much to learn. And I was trying to think, you know, I, I love learning from artists and, um, and athletes, and I'm like, like, why do I like learning from them so much, as much as I like learning from other business leaders? And I think part of it is, you know, artists and athletes, like they can't, they can't fake success. Like you're, like it's, you know, athletes, like you're kind of done. Like you know, you're you're successful until you're not, and then you know, it's over. It's just very obvious. Where I think business people, you can probably fake it longer, if I'm honest. Um, 
And so I like I like that part of it, you know, and um, it's just super interesting. So I think I think there's you know inspiration everywhere, and um, you know I've, I have a little more downtime these days, and I'm just super grateful to be able to you know read and consume and appreciate the written word that much, you know, that much more. Uh, Barbara Streisand, she wrote her autobiography. It's like 950 pages or something. I mean, I was committed to get it done, but like, wow. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, did I answer your question? <laughs> I don't know. It's a short version. <laughs> but thank you for even thinking that I'm worthy enough to consider it. So athletes are automatically are transparent, right? Because they can't they can't fake it, right? Yeah, so they can't. Yeah, yeah, so that's maybe one of the big reasons you admire them. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name's James Caton. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Agribusiness and Applied Economics. Excellent. And for several years now, um, I've been teaching students economic computation where they have to learn some programming skills, statistics, and it's really a crash course in everything they need. And what I'm noticing in the last about two or three years, especially since ChatGPT um, emerged, is that the demands for students to be really successful are greater and greater. Um, and I would say that's happening at the same time in the last few years, I think the, the year experiment to experiment with remote learning and all of that had actually put young students in a much more difficult position. So what would you suggest for a student who has to deal with these new challenges? There's so much opportunity, um, but it seems sometimes like maybe there's a rung or two or three in the ladder that's between the student, the young person, let's say, not just students, the young person and the opportunity. Yeah, wow, that's a, that's a packed, um, excellent question of which I don't have a great response for. I mean, I think that there's definitely the last several years, you know, have, whether it's, whether it's young people who are, you know, just getting into college or whether it's, frankly, young people in their career, they're definitely, even students, e even young, young professionals and young students who wouldn't be naturally ex introverted, you know, have, 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 have really started to become more introverted just based, based on that. Um, you know, so maybe one piece of advice is, you know, put yourself out there. Like, you know, don't, don't text if you can talk, don't, you know, just be more, be that much more human. Um, you know, yes, learn the technology, leverage the technology, et cetera, but there's still always going to be, you know, such an important human element to it. Um, and then I think I'll bring back, you know, some advice I had before, which is just be very purposeful in, you know, where you're trying to go. Because, you know, that said, if you have to be that much more deep in whatever field you're going into faster, you know, then understanding, you know, what skills you need to pick up uh, to get there more important than ever. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe we're at a point where you can't sort of take the, you know, winding road or yellow brick road as often as you could, you know, in during my time, which is to really explore, you have to be, you know, more focused, uh, more focused quickly. The other thing that I, I don't know if this is directly helpful to this question or not, but, um, you know, it seemed like for a time, the trend was sort of hop between jobs, you know, get out of college, try this company, try that company, try this job, try that job, uh, which, you know, in my parents day, you found a company, you stayed with it, and that was that. And you know, I, there's, there's, in my point of view, just looking back and seeing the different, you know, the different ways, is there's huge value to finding a place that feels like home, and being able to be there for a very long time. And you know, sure, expand and grow and do all of that. But you know, if you, if you can find a place that can be home base where you can continue to, you know, they invest in you, you invest in them, your skills, you know, continue to be challenged and, and you know, that's a beautiful thing. And, you know, that takes, that t takes some deliberate work, but, you know, that also, you know, can be, I think, a means to just make sure you're moving, you know, moving down the path and just always learning and having that learning mindset. So I feel like I did not give that question justice at all, and it was an amazing question that's going to haunt me for a while. So <laughs> I may need to get back to you. So thank you. So while we're we? Oh, there's one. Okay. Uh, thank you for 
stopping by with us. Uh, of course, I have thank a question. You. Um, so I was looking at your LinkedIn and I saw that there was a seven year gap between getting your bachelor and going back and getting your master's. And so you got your bachelor in mathematics and then you went back and got your master's in marketing and finance. And I'm currently a business undergrad right now. And I'm, as a student attracted to marketing and finance, do you think it was worth it? And do you think it served as a launch pad in your professional career? And if so, could you give an example? Yeah, um, it definitely, it was both, I would say, it was equal parts skill and confidence of my MBA. So absolutely, without question, worth it. Absolutely, without question. And I did an executive MBA program at St. Mary's, and St. Mary's is a great school. Um, and the executive MBA program allowed me to be with students that were like me, which was also super helpful because the group program, group programs were just incredible. Um, so that was amazing. And then um, very tactically, you know, the finance courses and the communications courses, you know, were just much more honed to professionals who had been, you know, in the market for a while. So I think you've got to pick your program to fit what you're trying to do. Not all are created the same and not all have the same. Um, and and you, have to be, you have to be ready to really take advantage of it because it's an investment. It's an investment in you know, your time and you give up some things um, while, you're, you know, while you're doing it. But you know, always, always just worth investing, so for sure. So yeah, keys, motivation, and then you probably learned as much from the fellow students as you did from sure. the class as well. And it just, it did, it did give me confidence because, you know, I mean, listen, I mean, you go to Microsoft and, you know, so many of the people are coming out of Ivy League schools and they've got, you know, they're just, they just, you know, I, here I was, you know, from a small town. <laughs> it just, it gave me confidence, it gave me confidence. So I'll ask another question while we're waiting for somebody to, oh, never mind. Good. Okay. Hi, I'm Andrea Smith, and I'm on the faculty here in the College of Business. Excellent. And you mentioned I versus we in your organizations. And yeah. could you take a moment to speak to students who might be doing an internship or getting their first job after graduation, what it looks like to be intentional about being that team person and making sure that they fit that, that bill? Yeah, um, so I think the, and it, it, it is a little tricky because, you know, let's say you're applying for an internship and you're doing an interview. I mean, they want to know what you or I <laughs> have accomplished and can do. And so you have to make that clear, you know, while having, you know, sort of a we mindset. And so I think it is as, you know, as simple and yet maybe as difficult as weaving the, you know, talking about how you contributed to a we success and how your specific you know skills experiences work ethic you know what, whatever your pie chart of of attributes are contributed to this greater success because i think the key is just understanding that you know this person is motivated by both the individual and team success and they understand how all of that comes together um, so i think that's the key which is just to really think through those examples and um, and just be you know and just be aware. Thank you, Ms. Reller. Thank you for gracing us with your wisdom tonight. Oh, gracious! Thank you. <laughs> I'm Dr. Greg Wettstein. I'm the uh, principal IT engineer for NDSU. Although it's kind of dodgy whether they probably want to claim me for most of the time. So <laughs> I think they do. For the purposes of my question, I'm actually uh, a founding member of an initiative called the Quixote Project, which is sort of an eclectic group of individuals who got together with senior systems architecture experience and national intelligence experience. We got together at the oh, wow. Fargo Brewery about a year and a half ago and thought we ought to try and save civilization as we know it. Oh my uh, goodness. So far with mixed results, but yeah. you know, entrepreneurs yeah. are always, always optimistic. Um, because of innovation and technology innovation, and you were witness to that through your career, we've placed ourselves in a somewhat unenviable position where we've crafted the infrastructure that we depend on for civilization on top of what has probably been charitably 
uh, regarded as technology Swiss cheese. Um, that was borne out, I think, December 31st, Christopher Ray and Jen Easterly were up on the hill and they testified that foreign adversaries have positioned themselves in the critical infrastructure that controls water, electricity, gas, everything that we depend on to get up in the morning for the purposes of uh, either destroying it or disrupting it, probably in concert with uh, international military action. And that was actually probably a result of an unreported issue in December where there was a need to throw those adversaries out of the water management system of a major United States city. So my question in sort of a roundabout way is, is that the Department of Homeland Security in concert with that testimony came out with recommendations to the various involved industries, use good passwords, change your passwords frequently, uh, make sure you know which machines are connected to the internet. Um, the same thing that we've heard yeah. for the last, last 10 years. Um, so my question to you would be, is there any prospect for entrepreneurial innovation to drive forth major advances in something like the technology industry that is just renowned for structural barriers due to network effects? Well, I'm sure the answer must be yes. <laughs> I'm sure it needs to be yes. <laughs> it needs to be yes. But I mean, you've highlighted, I, I mean, I think you've just ex accentuated the fact that there's just so much opportunity and need and need uh, in the technology space. And cybersecurity is just, I mean, it couldn't be a hotter space. And it's a hot space because there's just a lot of gaps and a lot of, and a lot of need. And, you know, I think we just need to make sure that in the U.S., we're just fostering an environment where that, you know, that innovation can happen, and you know, we're putting all the right, um, the right pieces in place, you know, to do that. I was just texting with a colleague last night who's in the middle of a cybersecurity issue, and you know, it's just not, it's just, it's, it's everywhere, and it's not much fun. And you know, when it gets even more tricky, in as in the situations you describe, you know, you, you, you understand you know, the significance of it. And, you know, I've been involved in some in the past. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's gnarly and, and, um, and it's ever moving target, ever moving target. And so a big piece of, you know, innovation, you know, needs to be directed at protection, not just, you know, productivity and advancing our, you know, daily lives, et cetera, but, you know, just protecting the foundation. And, um, and there is a lot of good innovation going in there today, but is it enough? You know, probably not. So thank you for doing what you're doing, and please keep doing it. Yeah, I guess I'll follow that up with a more positive question about innovation. So, oh, good. No, I, I, no, I no, no, I'm not that. saying yeah, yeah. You're okay, just balancing. So, so, yeah, so uh, I'm just curious, like, so you have a unique perspective in both technology and healthcare. So do, what do you see in the future for healthcare? Is there some innovation that you think might come out? You know, I mean, is, I'm just curious about do you yeah. have any insights about something that has a lot of promise? Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing I will tell you as students is if you get into healthcare, healthcare is very addicting um, because it has, there's so much that needs to be done and it has such personal impact. And so if you decide to get into healthcare, it's not for the faint of heart, so to speak, and because it has lots of challenges and you feel like you have to hit a brick wall a lot, but it is very addictive and rewarding. So um, yes, there's so much opportunity. Um, you know, one of the, so I'll just highlight a couple things and I'm guessing this will maybe resonate just given personal experiences, but you know, quality varies dramatically as with everything in, you know, in, that humans are involved in, you know, quality varies tremendously. But yet you don't know as a consumer, like how do you figure that out? How do you figure that out? I mean, still, most of us today, if you need to, to find a doctor, like you're asking your family, friends, and neighbors. Like really, is that the best way? Trust me, it's not. You know, so they're having a consistent means to you know, measure quality and then make that quality transparent to consumers. I mean, think how game-changing that would be. Completely game-changing. Which then brings to the next piece that would also be game-changing in healthcare, and that is navigation, which is, okay, so we now transparently know, you know, what 
how to measure quality and what the quality is by provider, but then you know, we have a system to be able to navigate consumers to, you know, to the right provider for what they're going through. Um, because you know, we all know how we try to do it today, and you know, it's less than perfect. And then the third massive space is uh, monitoring and you know, healthcare at home. I mean, there's just scenario after scenario after scenario where we can do you know, much more at home, which is far more pleasant for the consumer, far more comforting for the consumer, and you know, takes cost down, quality up, et cetera. So you know, just all those spaces are you know, just wide, wide open, uh, and technology and innovation are needed in every single one of them. So for health that care at home is, I, I'm imagining some of it might have to do with like wearing personal devices. Like, I yes. mean, like even the fitness watches or the things yep. like that to monitor your heart. Absolutely. And, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, dialysis is happening at home, um, which, you know, you think about that experience. If you've ever had a family member who's had to go through, you know, dialysis, it completely changes their life. And not to say that it won't change their life by having it at home, but again, it's just one step more, you know, more comfortable. So yeah, I mean, things that you would never could imagine happen you know, at home. I mean, getting, getting people home from the hospital X days sooner because you can monitor and do things, it makes a huge difference. I mean, every day that you're in the hospital, it takes you, you know, a week or weeks to recover from. So get people home, never have them go in. I mean, there's, I, I could go on and on and on and on and on because there's so much, so much opportunity in healthcare. Yeah, my dad uh, lived in his house till 97, in his own house. I mean, I think yep. being in his own house uh, helped his longevity a lot. So Absolutely. Like, yeah, so Absolutely. Okay. Um, we want that for everyone. Yep. Yeah. Other, other questions people have? Where are we at? There's two of them. I love these, by the way, so keep them coming. Yeah, I'll yeah. go <laughs> as long as anyone wants. Thank you. I have three daughters, so. They really awesome. do need more women as, as role models. So that's yes. awesome that you're here. Um, I got a quick question for you. Could you yeah. talk about how important it is like for women to learn how to network, especially with all men? And, and I know that's really a hard, sometimes a really hard thing for like my daughter's graduating from NDSU this year going into mm -hmm. the workplace and how she's gonna fit into a career. And for example, you moved to California and then to Seattle, did your husband follow you? Or did he move off to, you know, how you make all those hard decisions right. on whose career do we follow? Right. So, thank right. you. Right. Great, great questions. And thank you for being a great dad and raising them and thinking about that. So, um, uh, again, on this one, I could talk a lot. So, you shut, cut me off, okay? No, you can talk as long as you want. <laughs> um, so, I have an incredibly supportive um, husband. Uh, been married. We were just chatting about this. Um, been because you know both of us have been married almost 35 years and um, have three kids. So when we we both have careers, he's an architect, graduated from NDSU, as did our oldest daughter. She's also an architect, um, and um, so we tried to do the two career thing. Um, and I think there's a whole year neither of us really remember because it was so crazy with three kids and careers and traveling. And so he. Um, decided to be a stay-at-home dad and and did that and um, our kids have written many many class papers about having a non less less typical let me just call it um, situation with a, um, a stay-at-home dad my favorite story is our daughters did um, this is a total tangent will you allow it uh, so <laughs> our daughters both did ballet in um, Seattle at this, you know, prestigious ballet school. They both failed, so it's not a big brag point. But anyway, uh, and so you had to have perfect, you had to have a perfect bun to even be let into these, the classes, so perfect bun. And so he had to, he had to learn to make these <laughs> perfect buns. And so they would, um, <laughs> they would come home from school, and so then they had to get ready to go to ballet class. And so he'd sit them in front of Squawk Box, and so they had to watch Squawk Box, CNBC Squawk Box, <laughs> while he did their while he did their buns. And they they tell the funniest campfire stories about um, the, him doing their super tight 
buns with all these clips and water and watching Squawk Box for you know 30 <laughs> minutes. So they just have different memories than you know maybe if they'd had a more um, you know more traditional. So I do think that's you know very important for every family to sort of have their own you know sort of have their own their own path um, and pick that out. So then I'll go back to your starting question which is you know what do they have to do and do they have to do something you know different to network and i do find you know generalizations are tricky and and can be dangerous so i'll make some with that caveat which is i do find that girls and women you know tend to sort of caveat things more um, you know, this may be a stupid question or you know maybe this isn't you know just like caveat how they have discussions, whereas you know, boys and men just go much more confidently into you know, what they've accomplished and their question, et cetera. And so I think, you know, again, I'll just go back to self-awareness. And you know, you can, if you can give your girls one big thing, which is sort of confidence and self-awareness. And I don't believe in the you know, fake it till you make it thing. I don't believe in that. You've got to, the confidence has to come from you know, within. Um, and so how, you know, how can you, you know, help them, you know, help them do that? And I do think face-to-face -face interactions, you know, just the basics of, um, I was so proud of our son, he was giving a younger kid some advice in going to this interview. And it was just so fascinating to listen to him, a 19-year-old, describe um, to this, you know, 16-year-old how to try to get this job at a golf course. And you know, one of the things he said is, you know, you just you have to have an adult conversation with you know the golfers in the in the bag room, which look them in the eye, you know, and and just do all these things. And he had this great list, and I'm like, wow, like they do observe and they do learn, and you know, they do pick up on what you what you say. So, I think just you know. Putting yourself in uncomfortable situations, being willing to do that, learning from it, talking it through, you know, being uncomfortable, being nervous, and just getting through that. I mean, there's nothing like something you're so, so nervous about, and you go and have some level of success. Maybe not even perfect success, but some level of success, and just how that just becomes this self-fulfilling, wonderful circle. Um, and so, you know, create, trying to create those environments where they can gain that confidence, I think, is a gift that, you know, that you can give. Was that helpful? Yes, thank you. Okay, good luck. That's great. It reminds me of uh, our daughters when my wife was at a meeting and uh, I gave them a haircut and the only scissors we could find was their kids' scissors. So anyway, they told that story, but it didn't turn out as well as the story with your husband. But anyway, oh so. my gosh. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. We have a question right there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Hi. I just got a quick follow-up question. Actually, John has asked this before, which is about the Midwest economics. Because uh, you got such a successful career both in Midwest and in coastal area, so I would like to hear like how do you think about the Midwest economy and uh, what uh, what do you think is there any advantage and shortcomings for uh, the development for North Dakota, especially in those emerging industries? Yeah, I mean, I I don't think there are any shortcomings. I mean, I think we have you know the economy is doing well. We have talent. We have we have great institutions um, to you know train and develop skills. I you know I think I'll maybe say this, which is it is you know even if you don't sort of live somewhere else, move somewhere else, and have another experience, you know find ways to you know travel, build a network that's broader. Like just find ways to see the nation and see the world and really see. Um, and I think, you know, sort of having that more um, global and national view, you know, is an asset that we need to make sure. We need, we, we can't be insular. Wherever you are, you can't be insular. And so how do we, you know, that might be the one thing that we have to make sure that we, you know, develop as we go forward. And in terms of, uh, you said we need to also just kind of talk about the area more and one thing yes. we could do is 
if anyone took a picture on February 26th wearing short sleeves outside, just post that picture. Fargo, February right. 26th. Right. Overcome the perception about weather here. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, I, there was a, I'm on a board, I'm on two boards, but one of the boards is SPS Commerce out of, out of the cities. And, um, and one of the board members there was involved, is involved with the company here. And just, you know, I mean, just hearing him describe just how surprised he was to learn about just the, because it wasn't him just bragging about this company, but it was bragging about, you know, just sort of the environment that created this company. And he just, you know, and that was his whole point, which is, you know, even in the cities, we don't know about all the innovation that's happening here. So, you know, I think we all took it as our personal responsibility just to get, you know, get that word out more, more broadly. Yeah. We have an asset. Yeah. How many people have heard of Talus? If you haven't heard of Talus, I mean, so they're doing great things. I mean, there's, a, you're right. Yep. There's a lot of stories that people don't know about the right. great things going on. Right. Other questions people have. Mike's coming to you. I have three questions for you. Uh, the first would be- Help me would remember. You, okay. <laughs> would you say trust is as important as communication when it comes to business? Oh, I love that one. Thank you. And I should have uh, I should have mentioned that this is one. I mean, Governor Burgum has been a really important mentor to me, and so I'm you know I'm trying not to make it all about sort of what I've learned from him because I have learned a lot from others as well. Um, but one of the things that he talks about is trust being a force multiplier because if you can get to you know if you can get to trust, you know it's a foundation where so many you know, so many magical things can, you know, can happen. Um, optimism is another force multiplier, but you think about the power of trust and optimism and just how important that is. So absolutely, without question. And again, you know, you look at that question, you go, well, of course. But the reality is, it's not just believing it, but is that how you act every day? I mean, do you do you do what you say you're going to do? Do you re do realize the world is small and every interaction does count and you don't burn bridges and you seek to understand and like it's a lot of work. You know, trust is built over time, but it can be crushed in a second. In a second and with one action. And so you know, I think it has to just be, you know, internalized and thought about it. And I'm embarrassed I haven't even mentioned it during this discussion because it's that foundational. So super grateful that that was your opening gambit. And the second and third question could probably intertwine, or you know, the second might be answered, answering the third one. But is there anything that you wish you knew earlier in your career that you knew that you know now? So much, <laughs> so much. But you know, the interesting part of it is, you know, if I knew everything I knew now back then, you know, would that have stopped me from doing some things? Probably. Like, I mean, I do think my naiveness, um, you know, probably allowed me to try things that I probably had no business trying. Um, so it could be a you know beautiful beautiful thing as well. Um, you know I think one thing that I wish I maybe would have appreciated more is you know sort of that gravity versus purposeful. Just you know being open but more purposeful in the things that I did because I do think I would have made some different decisions which you know potentially could have put me on a path that you know would have allowed me to have more impact sooner. Um, you know, for example, like just even being a CEO, like I, I wasn't purposeful in saying like I, that's what I, I I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. You know, why? Like, did I not think that was like, why? I don't, uh, you know, I, I'm not even sure I could give you a great answer, but I mean, I loved being a CEO and to just uh, allowing myself to be in more positions, you know, to have more impact. Um, so I think that is a big one for me, just you know, being more purposeful and thinking about it. And it's this odd thing because I give, you know, I, I've given that advice to, you know, mentees along the way so many times, which is, you know, just if you're not, if you don't exactly know where you want to go and what you do, write it in pencil because you can change it. But at least write it down and make yourself, you know, decide how much deciding you want to do right now. And then you can, you know, and then you can edit from there. And you know, I didn't always practice what I preached, 
Um, so practice more of what I preach maybe is another thing I'd say. So another good one. And then last but not least, do you have any regrets? So many, I really do. But I don't, I don't, I don't, I have gotten better at not like beating my up, myself up about those regrets because I know that like, okay, I regret that, but then if I went on that path, then I wouldn't have had this experience and you know, my life is this composite. So I now, um, you know, I, I, I talk about my regrets to myself and sometimes to others with the sole purpose of, you know, trying to give back and have, you know, others learn from it. So, um, yeah. So bottom line is, I, like, I don't have an issue. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having regrets. You just need to, in my opinion, make it sort of a healthy dialogue with yourself. Yeah, thank you. Hey, well, that was, that's, this has been excellent. Uh, I appreciate you being here. This has been super inspirational. I've learned a lot. I know everyone else has. So let's please give one last round of applause to Tammy Rowland. Oh, and to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.